So it gives me really great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker today, who's really special, as I think you'll agree shortly um, when you listen to him. Um, William Jelani Cobb is an associate professor of history and director of the Africana Studies Institute at the University of Connecticut. Um, he's uh, more well known um, to those of us in the journalism business and outside as um, a writer of The New Yorker and a frequent contributor to MSNBC. His articles and essays have appeared uh, just about everywhere. New York Times, New Republic, The Daily Beast, Washington Post, Essence, Vibe, The Progressive, uh, TheRoot.com, and he's contributed to a number of anthologies. He's also a noted author. He's the author of The Substance of Hope, Barack Obama and the Paradox of Progress, and To the Break of Dawn, a freestyle on the hip-hop aesthetic, which was a finalist for the National Award uh, for Arts Writing. And he also um, uh, penned the collection Dave, The Devil and Dave Chappelle and other essays. Actually, I'd like to read that one. <laughs> and is the editor of The Essential Harold Cruz, a reader. And he's working on a book right now, which is called Antidote to Revolution, African-American Anti-Communism and the Struggle for Civil Rights, 1931 to 1957. So in the time we have, I've asked to come up and talk to us for uh, 15, 20 minutes or so, and then we're gonna have Jack Laser uh, sit down with him and do sort of a, a conversation that we've had, kind of conversations we've had this morning to bring out some of his points, and then we're gonna throw it open to you guys for Q&A before we force you to go downstairs for the last part of our session. So Jelani, uh, welcome to our conference. Please join us. Good afternoon. Um, first, I would like to thank the organizers and John Jay College for having me here. Can you hear me? OK. <clears throat> so I want to thank everyone for having me here. Um, it is a honor and privilege to get to talk to all of you. And um, there are a few things I wanted to talk, uh, you know, about, you know, I wear a couple of different hats. Uh, as an undergrad, um, I had a, this kind of quandary. I couldn't decide whether I wanted to uh, go to graduate school and study history and become a historian, or if I wanted to uh, become a journalist. I was an English major and a history, English and history double major. And at some point, I just decided I, I would just do both until I figured out which one I wanted to do more. Um, and I never figured it out, actually. I'm still doing both of those things. And, um, and so I tend to look at things narratively. I think that the historical part informs the contemporary part. And um, the contemporary part gives me a kind of better context for understanding the historical part. So I'm sorry I'm setting my timer here to make sure I don't um, suffer from long-windedness. But um, what I wanted to do was contextualize, to talk about things contextually. Uh, I think there are lots of people who can talk to you about uh, violence, is, the responses to violence in terms of public policy and uh, you know, the best practices in, in terms of how violence in its aftermath uh, are, are best, um, I guess, digested and, and, uh, and uh, metabolized, I should say. But I want to talk about this contextually. I'm coming uh, from Charleston. I was in Charleston, South Carolina this weekend. Uh, and uh, as you know, I've been in Charleston a number of times since the shooting uh, happened. And you know, it was notable. Uh, there was a theme uh, in my visits there. But it was much more pronounced this time. I attended a town hall discussion about the implications of the shooting uh, at the Emmanuel AME Baptist, uh, excuse me, Emmanuel AME Church uh, in Charleston in June. And the conversation continually uh, kind of seemed to hinge on a single individual, on the actions of Dylan Roof and what happened on that particular day and what happened in um, you know, that specific horrific incident. And there was a kind of terrible um, parallel that came to mind um, because I was thinking about this question historically. The town hall was held on Meeting Street in Charleston. If anyone has ever been to Charleston, you know, Meeting is kind of one of the main streets in downtown Charleston. So this uh, was, town hall was being held at a church there. 
And I recalled that in 1919, there had been a race riot on Meeting Street. Uh, and it had been the result of uh, two white sailors who had a dispute with two black men in a pool hall, which culminated in a fight, uh, which culminated in whites in mass uh, arming themselves and attacking uh, a number of blacks, uh, many of them fatally. The coroner would not divulge the number of black fatalities, and so there's never been known. Uh, and the numbers have ranged from uh, fewer than 10 to up to 40 um, casualties, uh, black people who died in the midst of this, this conflict. But what no was most notable to me about this was that there was a man by the name of Isaac Doctor. He was the second person killed in this context, in this race riot, in 1919. It was like Isaac Doctor. And I went back and looked through the list of, the number, the list of people who died in the church, um, one of whom was a man by the name of DePayne Middleton Doctor. And I saw that there was this kind of continuity that two people had died in the midst of racial violence, separated by 96 years, essentially on the same street, Meeting Street um, and Calhoun Street, where the uh, church exists, are right near each other. And to understand what happened, the violence that happened in June, we had to understand the violence that had happened there in 1919. And moreover, we had to understand the violence that preceded this. And so when we talk about violence in American society, we have a tendency to, to examine it as, if it as if it was exceptional. And we have a tendency to discuss this issue as if it is not deeply rooted in the American past. And so one of the first things that I would say as kind of journalists is to not be hesitant for us to inform ourselves, inform the contemporary um, in the roots of the historical. So just as a kind of quick aside, We've had uh, an ongoing conversation around violence, around state violence, uh, and around policing, for certainly since Trayvon Martin's death. Uh, and the conversation has only intensified. And the most notable, I guess, kind of connection that people made with this, uh, to me, the, the point at which I saw the, that people understood this in a very different context than uh, maybe the average person would suspect, was when I was in Ferguson last summer. And because Michael Brown, uh, the young man who was shot by a uh, police officer fatally uh, on Canfield Drive uh, in uh, Ferguson, uh, because his body lay there for four hours, uh, people began to understand this not simply as an instance of a police shooting or as people felt a instance of police brutality. Uh, the Department of Justice later disagreed uh, with that sentiment. But nonetheless, people understood it in a particular kind of historical way because someone said to me when I was there that his body lay out in the street as if he had been lynched. And so there was this explicit connection to the kind of ancestral uh, racial violence in American history. And in order to kind of understand how people could have that frame of reference, we had to understand that this was that the essential nature, the essential element of lynching was not merely to kill someone, but was to make a spectacle of violence. Um, it was the original form of American terrorism, and not one that was specifically um, reserved for African Americans. And so the historian by the name of Philip Dre, who's written a book uh, called At the Hands of Persons Unknown, uh, and he really does a great job of tracing the history of lynching to the colonial era, the American colonial era, and pointing to uh, its roots as a form of violence directed at British loyalists. And so when we think about this now, we say, oh, if people were tarred and feathered, uh, without actually thinking what it went, in, what went into pouring hot tar on a human being, uh, and the likelihood of this person dying as a result of their injuries. Uh, the early uh, American exuberance for cleansing themselves or exercising themselves of British loyalists uh, was kind of given more ballast and given more form uh, due to the dearth of judicial oversight. As many people here could probably tell you, uh, 
uh, the origins of our circuit court system, when judges actually had to travel through circuits physically. We watch the old cowboy movies, we know. You know, there's always a horse thief who's stolen, you know, a cattle rustler or someone who's stolen, stolen uh, you know, someone's livestock, and they say, oh, well, you know, the judge won't be back until March, uh, or something like this. And uh, the mass violence that, was, uh, that took place, the extra legal violence that took place, uh, was a kind of form of uh, community response to the absence of, kind of regular judici judicial oversight. Until the late 1880s, the majority of the people who were violent victims of, vic of lynching violence, mob violence, were white. It wasn't until about 15 years after emancipation that the number of black people surpassed, who had lynched, been lynched, surpassed the number of white people uh, in this country. And so we start with this kind of violent, this kind of idea of violent cleansing in American history. It also coincides with the fact that this is a frontier country, a country that prides itself very much uh, on the kind of frontier history and romanticizes its frontier history. We know a, lot, a few things about frontiers, one of which is that they tend to be exceptionally uh, gender imbalanced, they tend to be male heavy, uh, and as many uh, elements of, or organizations or places, locales where you find a lot of men, they tend to be disproportionately violent. It's not kind of coincidental that when we think about other frontier nations, uh, they tend they also tend to romanticize their uh, frontier pasts, like South Africa. You know, here we have the kind of mythology of the covered wagon going west and encountering uh, hostile Native Americans. Uh, and in South Africa, they have a corresponding mythology of the Vortrekkers, who were Dutch uh, settlers who moved north and their mythology was them set against the hostile indigenous population, in this case, uh, black people. And so it's not coincidental, coincidental that these frontier societies like Australia, like South Africa, like the United States, have all suffered with really serious problems with violence. And in the latter two, really serious problems with violence both within and against the population that was subjugated in order to, to make way uh, for the nation that, that followed. And if we move forward, we have this romantic figure in American history, the cowboy, who is a symbol of uh, you know, this frontier. And we move forward a little bit further into the 20th century, and we begin to see urbanization rapidly. And a different figure takes the place of the cowboy in American psychology. Uh, we have kind of two iconic figures that we associate with uh, America, both in terms of kind of cinema and our general mythology, and they're the cowboy and the gangster. There's a guy by the name of Robert Warshow um, who wrote a really interesting essay in the 1940s uh, called The Gangster is Tragic Hero. It's a really interesting assessment of what goes into a society that is, on the surface, very concerned with democratic rituals, democratic practices, but really valorizes um, and validates the idea of the outlaw as a hero. Uh, and the uh, outlaw who exists, the, the gangster exists as a kind of cowboy of the American um, urban um, arena. And so we have this idea of, we, of, of the cowboy as an independent person, a person who uses violence to mediate their concerns, to mediate their problems. And we respect this in a particular way. And when we look at later in American popular culture, things like uh, hip hop in you know, the so-called concern in the 1990s about gangster rap, which was nothing more than this kind of a, a audio update, an audio remake of the classic ideals of the American gangster, which is why you saw so many rappers taking the names of literal gangster movie figures like Scarface and so on. And we could kind of go through the entire psychology of this. So my point here is that violence in, in the United States is not exceptional. Uh, and it is not um, something that we can say that, why does this happen? We can say a more apt question is, how do we prevent this? How do we stop this from happening? But we have been um, very much addicted to, this is how we have mediated conflict for a very long time in this country. The country is conceived in, in violence, and we have to see this as a detour, not as an, a kind of aberration from a saintly past. As a matter of fact, there's a historian by the name of Thomas Slaughter uh, who uh, researches colonial uh, Philadelphia, has written about colonial Philadelphia. And Slaughter has a really interesting point that he raised. And he said that 
you know, Philadelphia has been kind of, I'm from New York, so I have a kind of particular disdain for Philadelphia <laughs> that, that just, you know, just happens. It's like only surpassed by my disdain for Boston. <laughs> but Slaughter had an interesting point. You know, it's like people have talked about the violence, about Philadelphia as a violent city. And, you know, we kind of mythologize the past saying, oh, you know, things were worse. Uh, things are now much worse than they were. And there was this period, you know, this idyllic period where people trusted their neighbors and so on. He actually found that you were more likely to be killed in Philadelphia during the colonial era than you were to be killed in Philadelphia in the early 2000s. Um, and this is a, goes to the point of the kind of violence being um, ambient in American society. So there are a couple of things I want to talk about just very quickly in terms of the things that I've been writing about and the things that um, relate most directly to my journalism. We have um, a kind of curious phenomenon uh, when you write about violence, when you write about state violence, um, when you certainly when you write about violence that involves any sort of you know, racial implication. And there's like a kind of boomerang effect that if you talk about state violence administered on a, on a black person. Rudolph Giuliani was a really great example of this recently when he said you know, to Michael Eric Dyson, uh, Professor Michael Eric Dyson, who criticized the stop and frisk policies that came into uh, existence under his uh, mayorship, mayoralty, he said, uh, well, if you all weren't killing each other um, so much, we wouldn't need these kinds of policies. Now, I know Michael Eric Dyson well. Um, I don't think he's killed anyone. Um, but there is a particular kind of eliding that goes here with a kind of concept of collective responsibility for the actions of a handful of individuals. So we would never say if a, a white woman were killed um, tragically by you know, a home invasion, we would never turn around and say, well, technically, you're more likely to be killed by your husband. True. Statistically, it's true. Is also as completely irrelevant to the matter at hand as the demographic or actuarial um, realities of African American death in the context of a specific instance of state violence, a specific question of police brutality, and a specific question of when and where we allocate people who are paid by our tax uh, dollars to use violence against citizens of this country. Two completely, two, two completely different conversations. And so what tends to happen um, is that the implicit question is never quite answered, which is, what is wrong with this group of people? It's the uncomfortable question. And you know, what the, um, which is also at least another kind of weird thing that I see happen very often when we have these conversations where people point out that African Americans are far more likely to be killed, far more likely to be the victims of violent crime, um, far more likely to be victimized in lots of different ways, as if this is going to be news to African Americans. It misses the point entirely. The presumption is that there's an opposition to police out of some sort of uh, naive belief that they're safe, people are safer and their communities are safer without policing. It's not the case. The frustration comes from people who believe, who are, are well aware of the dangers they face, the disproportionate dangers they face, also well aware that they do not trust the people who are empowered and charged with the responsibility of protecting them from that violence. And so it, it, it brings this catch-22 kind of situation. And I'll tell you just a quick anecdote, and then I want to uh, make sure we have time to talk. A few years ago, um, I was uh, unfortunately witness to a carjacking. And I mean, it was a bizarre, really it was a biz bizarre thing. I was living in Atlanta at the time and I was sitting uh, down at my window reading and I saw something that I thought, I thought it was hallucinating um, because I saw a car going down the street upside down. Uh, and then I walked out my front door and I saw that no, it was a car that was on its roof had slid down the street uh, as an SUV. Someone had stolen an SUV, tried to turn the corner too fast, and rolled the car. And by the time I saw it, it had settled onto its roof and still slid down the street in front of me. Um, a few moments later, uh, the person who uh, was at the wheel of the car um, kicked the door open, 
uh, got out and took off running, not you know a scratch on him that, that was apparent, and took off running. This was in a period of kind of high crime in Atlanta. A person uh, who was, I presume, was associated with him, drove up after this, looked at me, saw that I was the witness to what likely had happened, um, and then just stared at me for about 10 seconds uh, and drove off. And you know, the look conveyed everything that you know, was meant, I understood clearly what he was saying. A few minutes later, a police car pulls up and the officer explains to me that uh, this person has carjacked an elderly woman. Um, he's taken her car. Uh, this is, you know, you know, it's part likely part of a kind of dangerous group of people who have been operating in and out of this community, and asks if I've seen anything. And without any hesitation, I told the officer exactly what the person looked like. Maybe ten minutes later, the police car pulls back up and they have someone in the back seat who looks somewhat like the person I saw. And then I'm confronted by a question. On the one hand, my allegiance lies with this elderly woman who was victimized. On the other hand, my distrust for the police department of Atlanta led me to wonder whether this was the person who had done it or whether this was the most convenient person when the officer happened to have turned the corner. And these are the kind of complications that lead to frustration, that lead to protests. And so when people make the argument that Black Lives Matter, which is kind of the name of the you know, movement that we've most associated with this, they're speaking not simply uh, to people who are in power, they're also speaking to African Americans to try to, to try to say that these are concerns that are uniquely placed upon our shoulders uh, because we cannot necessarily presume that the outside, the broader society, will understand the nuances and implications of that particular moment where this police car is there. And I was like, what really will make this community safer? Is this actually the person? And is, and, or is my hesitancy allowing someone who is a danger to an elderly person in my community to potentially go free? And I think those are the kind of, kind of things that we need to explore. I think things that, these are the kind of questions that journalists are really well equipped to, to raise. Um, the question beneath the question, uh, the nuance that's beneath the seemingly obvious circumstance. And uh, I think I'll stop there and we can, we can entertain questions and we can go back and forth. Thank you. You want to sit down? We can stand. I think we should stand. Those of you who don't know Jack Glazer, who's going to be moderating our conversation, is associate professor and associate dean at the Goldman School of Public Policy at, oh, sorry. At East, uh, Jack Glazer is associate professor and associate dean at the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley. He's a social psychologist. He'll also be with us uh, later on today at one of the sessions. So Jack, and his, his full bio is in the Apache. Well, as a professor and a professional bloviator uh, in a room full of outstanding journalists, I recognize acutely that I'm probably the least qualified person to be asking Jelani questions, but I'm gonna, so I'm gonna be very selective and then I'm gonna turn it over to you so that we can have a full discussion. But I'll, I'll prime the pump here a little bit with some, some specific questions. So one of the things uh, you talked about, which I know is fresh on your mind, is Charleston. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, the, the Dylan Roof uh, attack was a, uh, was a terrorist attack. And I, I agree, and I actually as somebody who studied both terrorism and hate crime, uh, I agree that it it's a terrorist attack. And so, I, but I would like to hear you elaborate a little more on what makes it a terrorist attack and why there's so much resistance in some quarters to calling it that as opposed to other very similar kinds of attacks that are very readily called terrorism. Uh, so one thing, one thing I think we should keep in mind, there was a uh, question 
about whether or not it was appropriate to, oh, can you hear me? Uh, whether or not it was appropriate to refer to the attacks in Charleston as terrorism. Uh, and you know, it met the, uh, the definitions of terrorism. Uh, so when you look at the, was it the Joint Center, Joint Terrorism C Task Force, you, you kind of federal uh, agency, they have a definition of terrorism which says it is uh, the violent actions of non-state entities with the intention of uh, intimidating um, you know, broader populations or some such. That's got a rough approximation of what it was. Uh, and that was specifically what Dylan Roof did. And it wasn't simply that he wanted to kill people, he wanted this to be uh, a means of starting, as he called it, a race, race war. Um, and interestingly enough, there are other instances that when the racial angle is implicit as opposed to explicit, we're very clear that it's terrorism. So if we look 20 years ago, this year, um, we saw uh, Timothy McVeigh uh, detonate the rider truck, the bomb in the rider truck, killed 168 people at the Alfred P. Murrah um, office building in Oklahoma City. We referred to this as domestic terrorism. If we actually delved into McVeigh's motivations, he intended to start a race war. That was, he uh, was acting out a scene uh, from a book called The Turner Diaries, which is popular, which was you know then very popular in white right-wing uh, white nationalist circles. And so uh, Sarah and I have a colleague, Evan uh, Elsnos, who's written about this for The New Yorker, about Donald Trump and white nationalism, the rise of white nationalism. But that is what motivated. And when you looked at Timothy McVeigh, his animus toward the federal government was a kind of classic animus that dates back to the period right after Reconstruction, where it wasn't simply the uh, contempt for federal authority. His contempt was rooted in the idea that federal authority was being used uh, to wrongly victimize whites on the behalf of people of color. And that was why he blew up the building. But that was all buried kind of in the layers of McVeigh's thinking. And so we saw this as terrorism immediately. Dylan Roof, who said that he was killing people because white women were being raped, um, and he wanted to uh, you know, send this message and so on, we instinctively kind of diminished it. We stepped back from it. Uh, but you know, even again, history is instructive. The first anti-terrorism law we have here is the Klan Act of 1870. Uh, and when you look at the language of the Klan Act, it you know, was very much kind of like, you can see as the ancestral document of the Patriot Act you know, now. Let me, let me um, segue, sorry, segue from that a little bit. Um, and skip ahead to a question that I was going to ask later, which is about lynching, mm -hmm. uh, which you, you brought up as well. And that's another area that I've done, done some research in. And, and I will uh, admit that at the time that we conducted this research, we were looking at those lynchings of blacks from about 1880 to 1930 as a form of hate crime. And given more recent history, I'm changing my thinking about that because I'm recognizing that, uh, and there were, there were functions to treating it as hate crime, and we, we learned something in that, in that method, but um, looking now and recognizing this and, and paralleling it with the Dylan Roof incident to recognize that some, and, and Timothy McVeigh, that some of this, what we now recognize as terrorism, but looks like hate crime because it's motivated by racial hatred, is also motivated by this frustration that the that the government or you know the powers that be are not controlling uh, minority populations and particularly in the post-slavery era, um, blacks. And so you see, and as you pointed out, that most lynchings prior to 1880 were of white people, and then the numbers shift dramatically, and you see 3,000 or so over the next 30 or 50 years that are overwhelmingly black people, and uh, and and it is an extra legal. Uh, phenomenon where private citizens are forming posses because they're frustrated by the failure of the government to control its population. And so th this too seems like something that, that we could bring to bear. This history seems like something that we could, we could bring to bear and I wanted to know, it, do you think that, and now, now I'm gonna really throw something at you, which is to say that is, the, is some of the police violence that we're seeing today in part a vestige of that, 
and or is that mm -hmm. is that going too far? No. I'm, okay. So, um, uh, the mayor of Newark, um, Raz Baraka, he's my college classmate. Um, and uh, I've known him for a long time. And we had a conversation about a month ago, and he said something that was really profound to me. Uh, we were talking about policing and the city and the, reform, the reforms they wanted to make, and he you know, posed the question to me. He said, which seems kind of a ridiculous question until you actually add, try to answer it. He said, what is police work? And after a minute, I, I, I had to concede that I didn't know. I mean, on the one hand, we can say, okay, there's, there's arresting bad guys, you know, or you know, the serve and protect, you know. But what exactly are the parameters of things in society that we want police to do? And I don't think we have agreement on that. Like, at what point does a police officer not have to be a mental health um, specialist? Or does this person not have to be a um, conflict mediator in, in the instance of domestic uh, situations? I think in Newark they had about 40% of their police calls were domestic violence situations. And so I think that's one, that's one part of it. Um, now on the kind of substance of your question, here's, here's the troubling correlation. Um, we've seen you know, a good number of uh, racially, motivated um, riots you know, in, in American history, especially in the 20th century. Uh, and those riots almost uh, unanimously are a result of police behavior. Uh, now, the police, uh, instances of police brutality generally come um, in the context of other bureaucratic failures you know, educational failure, uh, ha failures of housing, all sorts of uh, problems. But unlike uh, those other problems, the person who is uh, providing substandard housing is not likely to physically touch you. The person who's not educating your child is not likely to physically touch you. And I think that is why policing becomes kind of a metaphor for a bigger set of bureaucratic problems and, and governmental problems. Uh, now, when we look at Los Angeles in 1992, um, or kind of accepting that large number of riots that happened after King's death, the uh, Detroit in 1967, Newark in 1967, Harlem in 1964, um, then you, like, you have another set that is around World War II, uh, Detroit in 1943, uh, Harlem again in 1943, Harlem in 1935. Uh, you can go through a whole litany um, of these riots. Every single one of these is relating to policing. Uh, and moreover, every single one of those, with the exception of Los Angeles in 1992, occurred in, the con in conjunction with increases in black populations. Uh, when we think about Detroit, now we think you know, the only white person in Detroit is Eminem. Um, but in the 1940s, as the black population uh, exploded as a result of a kind of industry in World War II, there came to be a great deal of white anxiety about the number of black people who were coming there. And a young upstart lawyer um, goes to the scene of this Detroit riot in 1943 and files a report in which he says, the police in this city are not here for the purpose of solving crime or protecting. They are here for the purpose of making sure that black people remain in particular parts of the city and that they are not in other parts of the city. That young lawyer was named Thurgood Marshall. Um, and the same sort of thing happens in Harlem, you know, with the Harlem population between 1910 and 1935. In 1910, blacks were about 10% of the Harlem population. By 1935, they're about 70% of the Harlem population. Uh, and the Harlem riot in 1935 happens as a result of police brutality. And so there is this kind of idea that policing, whatever else the parameters of it are in 2015, the historical legacy of policing has been about the control of populations that people don't want in, other, in particular places. And we can't escape that. Um, Ferguson is, is, a, is another example of it, very clear example when you look at the demographic change that happened uh, in the last 30 years there. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, I'm sorry, that was no, a long answer. Yeah, yeah. That was great, but okay. I have several more for 
Uh, Brian Charles, I'm a freelance journalist. I teach uh, journalism at uh, Louisiana State University. So oh. this is a follow-up to your, your, your comment about uh, that historical practice of police departments to contain uh, minority populations, specifically black populations. We've seen this rise in militarization of police departments, and a lot of it's been blamed on policy. It's been blamed on kind of uh, the, the you know federal policy to get rid of these large, uh, I guess, toys for these police departments. Mm -hmm. But how much of of the you know kind of the organizational compass to buy these things is based on that containment strategy and, the, and that history of containment of minority populations. I mean, it, is there a correlation between militarization? And, and 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 the efforts to historically to contain uh, mm -hmm. blacks and minorities. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think uh, Radley Balco has written a book on it. It probably knows speaks about it better than I could. But I think that there are a couple of things that that are apparent. One is that um, not just you know historically, but also in the contemporary context, people use race in these sort of proxy ways. Um, uh, you know, the NRA is much more sophisticated in the way that it does now, but for a long time, its appeals were kind of directly racial in terms of saying why there needed to be as uh, liberal gun laws as there are in this country, uh, and it was to, you know, effectively to protect yourself from the menace of, of black people. Uh, when we go back to the end of Reconstruction, that is explicit. <laughs> when we see, like, we were at the centennial anniversary of, um, Birth of a Nation, the film Birth of a Nation, and that is the explicit appeal that is made, you know, that, you know, people have to gather together to protect white womanhood um, from the menace of, of black men. And, you know, then there's, you know, these conversations, of course, about uh, drug policy and, you know, going back to the uh, beginning of the 20th century when people said that cocaine would make black men um, impervious to bullets and you know, lustful after of white women. Uh, and so I think that this is kind of the same old story, um, you know, again and again and again. Uh, one of the things I don't think that we tend to talk about is that the ways in which, you know, the, you know, kind of liberty and freedom of white people is different, deeply implicated in, you know, these kinds of questions now. Uh, and so certainly, um, you know, the attenuated nature of the Fourth Amendment <laughs> right now um, and the zeal uh, to defend the Second Amendment I don't think those things happen in a context that is, um, you know, kind of absent race. Although we think about it now in kind of more broad ways, uh, it was notable to me because, um, you know, Donald Trump stood up and said that uh, we should be afraid of Mexicans because they're rapists, and I was like, oh, well, you're stealing our stereotype now. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, I was like, wait, you know, you, like, you you hated them for taking their jobs, and you hate us for crime. Like, you don't you know, get your, get on your, get your stuff straight. Um, but, but I think that, that those sort of things are, are malleable and they wind up being applied in lots of different ways to lots of different people. Um, so I, um, hi, my name is Hannah Garcia. I'm with Law Week Colorado in hi. Denver. Um, and so since we're talking about solutions journalism and you're talking about context, uh, I was watching a crime show, like a crime drama last night or the night before, because what else are you going to do at 2 a.m.? But, um, and they were interviewing a, a Hispanic kid about, and they were trying to get him to name a suspect, and he didn't want to, and they were, but they were getting at, like, his distrust of the police and the fact that, um, you know, they don't really protect them, but they're willing to bring them in to try to solve these crimes and stuff like that. So it struck me, one, that they acknowledged it, but then they moved on, and you never, and then, like, they tricked him into giving them information, and then they moved on, and you never heard from the kid again in the episode. Um, and it kind of struck me that, that, that people are aware of, of the context sometimes, right? And that they're aware that some of these issues exist. And so again, since we're talking about solutions journalism and we're talking about context, um, how do you, can you talk a little bit about how you find the context and like how you make it matter and how you make that decision, I guess? Oh, I mean, I think, I mean, sometimes the context is there. Um, you know, if you just start talking to the people about the right questions. So one of the things that happened in Ferguson is that, I mean, I teach about the Dred Scott decision in my classes, um, which was based on the case of someone who was enslaved in Missouri. Uh, but when I got to Ferguson, I was talking to people who were saying, no, Dred Scott is buried like two miles from here. Um, and so for them, that was local history, and they understood that very clearly. 
um, and Shelley versus Kramer, which is uh, 1948, uh, you know, familiar with it, the housing uh, covenant uh, Supreme Court decision. And that was a St. Louis case, also not very far um, from St. Louis. And so when you're talking with people, that was, that's American history kind of writ large, but for these people, this was local history. They knew, they're like, yeah, they may not have said Shelley versus Kramer, but they said, yeah, they used to have these restrictive laws and they would tell you the places, you know, because their father or their grandmother or whatever couldn't be in that place. Uh, and I think that that's part of it. Um, I think some of it is just not being afraid of archives. Um, you know, I have a colleague, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones, who's written some really great stuff about educational um, segregation uh, and housing segregation. And, you know, Nicole spends, like, time in archives the way historians do. And I think that sometimes we don't, we think about those things as kind of separate spheres. Um, but there's all sorts of things. When I was flying to Ferguson, I had this amazing thing happen. It was like the most amazing thing ever. Uh, I was flying to Ferguson. I happened to be seated next to a woman from, the, from St. Louis. We start the kind of normal chatter that you have when you're on a flight with someone. And I mentioned what I was doing. And she said, oh, um, that's interesting. Uh, let me give you my email. And I was kind of like, OK. And she said, I work in the Missouri State Archives. And she said, you should look at this and this and this and this. And she just kind of starts scribbling these things out about the history of housing policy. And she said, uh, and if you come down to the archives, I didn't get a chance to go to the archives while I was there, but she said, if you come down to the archives, I'll just kind of walk you through, you know, some of these materials that we have here. And I was like, jackpot. Like, some of the stuff that she sent me was, um, was kind of easily, uh, ex you know, easy to access. Um, and I didn't even have to go to the archives for it. But uh, yeah, I think those kind of things are important. Um, as well, so not be afraid of kind of going there. I got to say one more question. Well, actually, two short ones. Very quick. Mine's very short. What happened with the carjacking? I just got to know. I told the I told the um, the cop that I didn't know, and he was kind of like, you know, you sure? And I was like, I, I don't know. I mean, I, that could be the guy. It could not be the guy. Um, and he drove off with him. I don't know what what happened after that. Hi, my name is Amelia Schoenbeck, and I'm a freelancer based in New York. Um, you said that in this particular moment, journalists should be looking for the questions underneath the questions, and I really agree. Um, yeah, sorry, you said that journalists should be looking for the questions underneath the questions, and um, I'm wondering, as you've watched the reporting um, that's been done on this conversation that we're having now about police violence and communities of color, um, what you think journalists are misunderstanding or misrepresenting in their work? Mm -hmm. um, I think that, I mean, there's, there's a range of things. One of the things that happened in Ferguson was that the police started arresting journalists. And that gave people a really clear idea very quickly um, about, uh, you know, what kind of um, bureauc bureaucracy and what kind of leadership there was there. Uh, and I saw instances in which people were um, targeting uh, media. They were firing um, tear gas at media people. Uh, and so I think that lent itself to um, an easier assessment that these people are not necessarily good actors, or they're not dealing you know, from the top of the deck. Um, that said, I think that we tend to um, contextualize white violence in a way we don't with black violence, generally. Uh, and so we saw Dylan Roof. I know way more about Dylan Roof um, than <laughs> I knew early on about Michael Brown. Um, and so, you know, Michael Brown, is the video of him uh, taking the uh, cigarettes or cigars or whatever from the, the store um, and kind of shoving the man out of the way, and this was like dissected in this kind of way. but. I knew that Dylan Roof's mother uh, worked in a bar, that you know, his father was kind of a manual laborer, that there's uh, the whole kind of context. It's kind of like the default setting, the presumption of the default setting for the white kid is to do well. Um, and how did he go wrong? Whereas you know, for someone else that is just um, you know, what they do. And I think I've seen that you know, a bit um, in the coverage of these kind of stories. And I also think that, it's something that I'm guilty of in my own thinking, um, and I try to 
refrain from. But I think that we sometimes particularize things as racial problems. Um, but there is a very real kind of question, set of questions around the Fourth Amendment in this country right now that should concern everyone, that should concern everyone who is a citizen um, of this country. And if something can be done and is kind of deemed to be within the parameters uh, of acceptable law, and this is a precedent, um, that precedent could be applied to other people. I'll give you a good example of this. In, um, in Georgia, uh, about 12 years ago now, uh, the Georgia legislature, uh, as it is wont to do, um, decided that it was going to crack down on juvenile crime. Um, now, juvenile crime had already been dis declining in the state of Georgia, but, you know, Georgia, I can say this because I have generations and generations of Georgia folk, like, I'm the first New York generation, so I can say this, like, you know, those folk are kind of sometimes slow to pick up on things. Um, not everybody, just the ones with power. Um, <laughs> so, so um, they cracked down uh, on juvenile crime, and what they basically did was get rid of their juvenile courts. Uh, and so or they vastly uh, diminished the role of the juvenile courts. And so they just started trying, uh, you know, a number, uh, trying juveniles as adults for a wide array of crimes. And predictably, uh, you know, lots of young people of color, lots of young black kids started getting arrested and sentenced to really harsh uh, sentences and being sentenced at even as young as 14 years old to serve time in adult prisons, uh, which is just no, by no means is this a good idea. You can actually read reformers at the beginning of the 20th century, actually in the late 1890s, who are saying that we have to separate adolescents from adult hardened criminals unless we're trying to create a school for crime. Like this is what will happen. People will be mentored in the ways of committing you know, more serious crime. We've known this for more than a century. But this is what happened. Uh, and I became part of a group of people who were interested in uh, getting these laws uh, changed, um, which Georgia did um, after a good number of, of a very difficult um, number of years fighting for this. But to my shock, when people began organizing about this, a large number of the people who were there were rural white families. Uh, and so these laws had kind of had young black people in mind, but the law is on the books, <laughs> and so it is what it is. And so once you start getting uh, poor white kids who were being sentenced for these, uh, in these kind of abysmal ways, people said, oh, wait, there's a problem. It's kind of like the uh, orange is the new black kind of phenomenon. We go like, wait, we're arresting like white women. We, could, we need those. You know, <laughs> they're important. Um, and like, what do we, what else do we, do we do? And it's, it's sad to think that these two things have to be kind of conjoined in that way, but I do think that that's part of it. So talking about those things in ways that highlight the ways uh, that this is not a particular specific racial incident and only these implications are not solely among African Americans, I think is also an important thing. So it's a long way of saying that, but you know, I talk anecdotally, my people are from Georgia. <laughs> Take care. So on that great note. Thank you, Jelani.